Welcome back to Module 3. In this section, we're going to be talking about Isaac Newton and his Universal Law of Mutual Gravitation. We're still in Chapter 3 for this video, but after this, we're going to be moving on to Chapter 5. Now, Isaac Newton is one of the most famous and most prolific physicists and scientists uh, of all time. But it is worth remembering the foundations that he is coming in with. Our history of astronomy, both in early module one and in the previous lecture section, help us to understand that it has been about a hundred years worth of time in the 1500s and early 1600s of going from a geocentric universe to a sun-centered system, getting the observations to be able to get evidence for that model from Galileo, as well as additional observations and experiments uh, involving astronomy, and then Kepler coming up with his laws of planetary motion based on patterns in the data. All of these people led to the scene that Isaac Newton comes in on so that he is able to build off of their work and not start from scratch. He is most well known for some of these ideas because he was the one who wrote out physical interpretations and the equations and math behind what causes the things that we were seeing. Uh, and that is really important to science as a whole. He could not have done it, however, without the initial ideas and observations from the people that we've seen previous to uh, this section. Now, the concept that we care the most about for our curriculum is Isaac Newton's universal law of gravitation. If we were taking a physics class, it would be Newton's laws of motion that we care the most about, including F equals MA, uh, but that's not in our main curriculum goals for this introductory science class. So the equation that we will see the most from here on out is going to be uh, Newton's law of gravity. So the equation on the slide is the force of gravity equation. We'll have a deeper look video also to help walk us through it. But I want to make sure we understand all parts of this, of this equation. So F stands for the force of gravity. The capital G is a number value. It is the same across the whole universe to the best of our understanding, and it is called the gravitational constant. It actually took different experiments, not by Isaac Newton, to get to pinpoint the exact number for it. We don't have to have that number memorized, but it is 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11 in the units that it needs to be. Now, I tend to use big M and little m, so capital M and lowercase m, to represent the two objects that we care about, because in our use cases, we are talking about one thing orbiting another. Uh, in many other places and other textbooks, you might see M with a subscript of 1 and M with a subscript of 2 to represent objects 1 and 2, and that works perfectly fine as well. So make sure that you know that you can add the subscripts if they're helpful to you. You can leave them off and just make sure that you're thinking of the big mass and the small mass. So big number value mass and the small number value mass. And then on the bottom of this equation, and the most important part for us to keep in mind, is not only is the distance between the objects important, but it is to um, the second power. It is squared. That distance squared means that changes in distance have a really big effect, and so the force of gravity works well when we are near, um, when we have objects near each other, and so objects very far away um, don't have as strong of a pull of gravity as objects close by. Now, when we talk about the acceleration of gravity, it isn't the entire force of gravity, but rather the big G and big M divided by R squared part um, that is experienced on the whole around an entire object that we have in mind, like the Earth or the Moon. It's a way to compare how different object number two um, objects would fall in that, uh, in that region because of the mass that we're talking about and being the distance from its center uh, to the surface. So that's a lot of words for saying that although the force of gravity cares about both masses, the way things accelerate, the way they speed up or slow down, the way that they fall, if we are talking about two objects being dropped in the same um, location, so on the surface of 
Earth or on the surface of the moon, they will fall in the same way and they will hit the ground at the same time. We don't want to mix up the word force with the word acceleration if we start to look into this more on our own or we start to read the textbook in more detail. When we say gravity on its own, we will by default be talking about the force of gravity and not the acceleration of gravity. But it is so important for us to recognize that things that are dropped at the same time will fall at the same rate as long as there aren't other forces like air resistance in the way. Which is why this picture of an astronaut dropping a hammer and a feather, an experiment that was done on the moon in the Apollo missions, uh, helps remind us that the moon doesn't have any air, so it doesn't have any air resistance. Now let's talk about the force of gravity a little bit more. I want you to pause the video after you read the question and the options so you can decide uh, what would cause the force of uh, gravity on the moon by the earth to increase by the greatest amount. So pause the video, read through the options, and you can kind of work in your notebook as much as you'd like to, and then unpause when you're ready with your answer. Okay. Now what I want us to recognize is that the most effective way to answer this question is to have the equation in front of us and to, um, to think about the numbers being plugged in. But I want to talk us through the way that critical thinking can go a long way even if we aren't feeling that comfortable with our math skills or we don't have the equation readily accessible. When we think back to the equation, one of the big takeaways I want us to have is that the two masses involved, big M and little m, are multiplied together. And if we think about the way multiplication works, uh, it doesn't matter the order that we talk about those things. So what I mean by that is 3 times 5 is 15, and 5 times 3 is also 15. It didn't matter what order we wrote those in because we're just multiplying them together. The reason why I'm highlighting that is because option 1 here, to double the mass of the moon, and option 2, to double the mass of the earth, both change the equation in the same way. They would both increase the force of gravity, and they would both double the force of gravity. Neither one of those masses is treated differently in the equation than the other one, which means options 1 and 2 both will change the um, force, and they will change it in the same way. So critical thinking with just that piece of knowledge means that we can't pick option 1 or 2 because they're both going to do the same thing. Neither is better than the other. And we actually can't pick option 4 because that suggests that none of them will change the force. So before we do any other math at all, we already have our answer just from critical thinking and that one piece of understanding from the equation. So answer three here is the correct one, and the reason why that matters is when we look back at the equation, I am going to go back a slide uh, or two, when we change that distance and we cut it in half, that half is raised to the second power, it is squared, and all of a sudden we have changed the force by a factor of four, and we get a much stronger force of gravity because of that fact that that distance shows up effectively twice distance times distance, or distance squared. So option three is the correct answer here, and if you struggled with that, I go through it in more detail in the Deeper Look video, and I encourage you to watch that and ask questions of me as, as you see fit. Now, the reason why gravity matters to us right in this moment as we started um, the module with the orbits of planets is that to orbit something, we need the force of gravity, and the force of gravity determines the way in which we're going to be able to orbit something. Now, to start an orbit, we have to be moving sideways relative to the surface, because if we imagine having any object, here's some, um, some post-it notes, and if we don't start them with any forward motion, we just let go, they'll drop, and they'll drop to, um, to the surface, towards the center of the Earth. So if we want to put something into orbit, we want to put a spacecraft into orbit, for example, not only do we have to get it away from the surface, it has to have some initial up, but more importantly, it has to go sideways. And it has to go sideways very fast, because if it goes too slow and we stop the engines, it's just going to plop right back into the ocean. If we get it just right, we get this perfect in-between, and on the diagram it's actually C, the label here, C for circle, we'll say. 
the just right speed gets it on a closed orbit and a nice perfect circle orbit as well. And that just right speed is 8 kilometers per second or 17,500 miles per hour. That's pretty fast, which is why it's tough to get rockets into space and to get satellites going. But once they're there, that's a stable orbit. And if we go too fast, and too fast might be a bad thing for our communication satellites, but too fast is great if we're trying to get to the moon or to Mars. Um, we can escape Earth's gravity and actually make it out um, of a closed orbit um, and out into the solar system. The escape velocity for Earth is 11.2 kilometers per second, so a little bit faster, but not like double the circular orbit speed. You don't need to write down those numbers, but just to have a sense of how strong gravity is and how strong gravity still has to be even in orbit. There is a lot of gravity in space. The moon is held in its orbit around Earth because of gravity. We get this misconception that there's no gravity in space, and that's a big problem for us. So even before we move on, if you want to pause the video so that you can write in all capital letters, there is lots of gravity in space. Um, then I'll let you pause and, and you can make sure to make that note to yourself. All right. Now, Newton's theories, um, which included the universal law of gravitation, were published in 1688. Uh, they were the Principia um, uh, Mathematica. And his universal law of gravity, combined with the laws of motion, which are in our textbook if you're interested, in 3.2, they explain the reason why Kepler's laws work, the reason why those patterns were showing up in the data. Once we had all of this together, both Kepler's laws of motion, Galileo's uh, evidence to help support the heliocentric model, Newton's law of gravity, that really was the true culmination of setting aside ancient astronomy ideas and, and solidifying modern astronomy. But when we think back to the very start of the semester, the first lecture section when we talked about uh, what science is, it is a way to gather knowledge and any idea we come up with, any hypothesis, we need to test uh, against ex experiments and observations. So for us to be able to say that the law of gravity is a theory, to elevate it to that known beyond a reasonable doubt, we need to have evidence that supports this. So I'm gonna highlight two stories for us. The first is Halley's Comet. So Edmund Halley was tracking a very bright comet uh, through the inner solar system, the part of its uh, travels where it had these beautiful tails that we learned about a couple um, videos ago in module two. And by tracking enough of the orbit to get that elliptical shape, and using both the ideas of Kepler's laws and more important Newton's laws of motion and gravity, he figured out what that whole orbit would have to look like and therefore what the period of the orbit would have to be. Now this is a comet that takes 76 years to go around in its orbit and Edmund Halley had his prediction down to the same day, the same 24 hour period for where he said it was gonna be when which is pretty darn impressive um, when we think about how much uh, has to go into just the like math on paper to predict something that long from just a few months worth of observations. The other really strong uh, example of this uh, is when we first discovered the planet Uranus. It was by accident. It was discovered in 1781. William Herschel has, uh, is well known for his uh, observations from having enough money to build big telescopes in his backyard and enough uh, uh, property to have a yard. But uh, when he was surveying the sky one night, he noticed a point that had moved relative to the background stars and he was tracking it. And he discovered the planet Uranus, which is too faint to see by eye, which is why it hadn't been seen before, but is pretty easy to find with a telescope. That was pure luck. Um, I mean, not so much luck when you realize how much of the sky he was looking at every night, but he did discover it. It didn't quite work with Newton's law of gravity and Newton's laws of motion. There were points where it seemed like it was going a little too fast or a little too slow as if something was tugging on it. The way that um, if you're walking a dog, the dog kind of tugs you um, ahead or behind depending on where it is relative to you. So the 
big question that astronomers of the time had to answer is, do we need to fix Newton's hypothesis of gravity? Maybe this is the test that proves it false. Or is there something that we're missing? And we can do some calculations to figure out what to look for to kind of see if that's a better um, way to address this problem. Maybe we're missing some additional hidden mass even farther from the sun. And so different groups got working on this problem and two separate groups found Neptune within weeks of each other in exactly the place that they had predicted that they should find it. Neptune is the only planet in our solar system that we predicted what it should look like and where it should be and then found it afterwards rather than just a discovery that we added to our, um, to our list of found things. So Neptune and the discovery of it is one of the greatest stories of the scientific method uh, that astronomy can provide us. And it was one of these really strong tests for Newton's laws of gravity. From here on out, we're going to be talking about um, some more complex science in chapter 5 and then the way that telescopes use that complex science in chapter 6. But if you have any struggles with uh, these early parts of module 3, please make sure to check in with me so that we can get us all sorted and on the right track to continue. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.